All right, let me get us started for this evening. I want to welcome you to 10th Church, and this is our uh, final lecture of the inaugural lecture series for the Boys Center. And uh, you can actually, if you want to see the earlier lectures, they're all, they have all been webcast and recorded, and they're on our website, and you can find them there under the Boys Center. And tonight, actually, we're webcasting this one as well, so we'll welcome those who are hopefully couldn't make it tonight, but are able to watch it uh, live on webcast. And uh, this evening, we have the, the privilege of uh, Dr. Carl Truman uh, being here with us, and his topic for tonight is Inerrancy, Scripture, and the Church, from Ignatius to the Reformation. So it's a large section of history that he's going to address for us tonight. And this really ties off, we, we had an earlier lecture, actually almost a year ago, Dr. Jeff Jew came and lectured on the same topic from the 18th century to the present. And those two lectures were meant to pretty much be uh, the, the, uh, the big picture context for why we even talked about this topic of inerrancy to begin with. So we're glad that uh, Dr. Truman could be here and finish it off. Dr. Truman is also, he is a pastor at Cornerstone OPC in Ambler, Pennsylvania, and has been on faculty at Westminster Seminary teaching church history for, is it 10 years? 13 years. So we're um, grateful that you're here tonight and appreciate that very much. Before we start, let me, let me pray for us and then we'll have Dr. Truman come and, and speak to us. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for getting us out of bed today. Thank you for keeping our hearts beating, for sustaining us and feeding us and clothing us. And we give you thanks that we can gather this evening in a degree of leisure to consider together what it is to, to believe and to understand and to confess that your word is, is reliable, that it's trustworthy in everything that it affirms, that we can stake our lives on it and know that because you are the one true and living God, that you do not lie, that you do not pull punches, that we can trust you when you speak. And we pray that you'd help us to, to grow in our understanding of what that means tonight uh, through Dr. Truman. We pray for him as he speaks to us, that you'd be with him, that you would take his efforts, his study, his preparation, and uh, bring it to bear on us and this church in ways that are for our good and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Truman, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, my topic, I noticed that the, uh, the title in the program was different to the one I'd given. Uh, not that different, but the title I was given was 100 to 1800, so I'm glad to see that I have to do 200 years less work uh, this evening. I want to talk about uh, Christian attitudes to Scripture from 100 AD to around about the end of the 17th century. That's a lot of church history to cover in 45, 50 minutes, so inevitably what I'm going to do is going to be relatively superficial. I want to zero in on a few high points as we skim through that millennium uh, and focus on things that I think are perhaps of particular interest or relevance to us today. One of the perennial criticisms of Protestantism is its close connection of the doctrine of Scripture to truth. It's sometimes said that this is an innovation of the 16th and 17th and sometimes even the 19th century. What I want to do this evening is to show that the, the understanding of Scripture as truth is not a uniquely Protestant thing. It goes right the way back to the early church. I should perhaps also uh, make clear what I'm not going to do this evening. Uh, history is a, a descriptive and an explanatory discipline. So what I'm not going to do is demonstrate the, the doctrinal truth of anything I'm going to say. What I'm essentially going to do is say that certain people in church history held these views for the last 1500, 1700 years. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they were correct. Uh, the correctness or not of their views is something to be established by comparison of their views with Scripture. Uh, I am neither paid to do that nor am I competent to do that. So I'm simply going to play to my strengths this evening. If we go right the way back to Scripture itself, of course, Scripture uh, points towards the importance of words 
Uh, nothing is more fundamental to God's identity, and I'm going to return to this point when I talk about the Reformation. Nothing is more fundamental to God's identity than the fact that he speaks. First thing we know about God in the Old Testament is, after his existence, is that he speaks. God speaks, and where there was nothing, there is something. Uh, the Old Testament presents a God who speaks in a verbal manner. There is a verbal component to what uh, God, to who God is and to what he does when he speaks to Adam, when he speaks to Abraham, when he speaks to his people wandering in the desert. Sometimes he will use signs, but always he will accompany it with some kind of verbal explanation. There is a basicness to God's verbal nature, one might say. And the Bible itself also speaks, uh, talks of God commanding the writing down of his words. Uh, Moses and the Ten Commandments is perhaps an obvious example. Jeremiah is told out to write down the words of prophecy. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21 makes it very clear that even though Peter was there on the mountain and he saw Christ transfigured, yet he has something that makes him more certain that it's all true, the written oracles of God. So Scripture itself bears testimony to the importance of words and to the importance of written documents. Well, as we move from uh, the first century into the second century, I think we need to realize that we, we hit a period of church history that is probably the most dramatic of all. Probably most, if not all of us here are Protestants. We're reared on the idea that the Reformation is the most explosive moment in church history. Uh, I think I could make a good case for at least two other points in history being more significant than the Reformation. I, I won't elaborate on that just now. But certainly, the end of the first, beginning of the second century has to be perhaps the real watershed in church history. That's the moment when the church moves from being under direct apostolic authority to something that is at least initially more nebulous you imagine yourself living at the end of the first century and you realize that the apostles are passing away, the question that's going to come pressing in on you is going to be, well, where does authority lie? And this makes the writings we have of the, the, the late first and second century uh, particularly interesting and instructive because there we have the church wrestling with the issue of authority in its earliest form after the passing of the apostles, these men who uh, either were with Christ or met him sort of dramatically, as Paul did, after his ascension on the Damascus Road. And the church historians, typically, we, if you're teaching early church, you'll typically talk about three things coming into play. The beginning of the first, uh, end of the first, beginning of the second century. First of those things is church government. We get uh, that really being laid out for us in the pastoral epistles of Paul. You know, as Paul is, is looking towards the passing of the apostles, he's laying out plans for the church, and he talks there about the appointment of overseers and deacons. So there's a, a church structure that is going to emerge in the late first, second century. Second thing is what we call the rule of faith. And this is an interesting summary of the things that all Christians really ought to believe that appears in numerous documents in the second century. It's like a creed. If you say the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed on a Sunday, the rule of faith is a bit like that, but with one big difference, and that is wherever it occurs, they use different words. It's the same content but different words, and that, of course, indicates that what you're dealing with is not something that's formalized. It's just an agreed content. They've not yet agreed on the verbal form. And the third thing we get reflection upon is that which we want to talk about tonight, and that's Scripture. And we get reflections in the early centuries on canon, the extent of canon, and the nature of scriptural authority. And I want to really sort of zero in, particularly on the second half of that, as I think it connects most directly Second century, we have a collection of writings we call the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, now, if we were able to, to jump into... Any Doctor Who fans here? You're all too serious to watch Doctor Who. I don't watch the latest, but I grew up on Doctor Who uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, and Doctor Who has this time machine. If we could all jump into Doctor Who's time machine and go whizzing back, 
uh, to the second century into Palestine, and we were to wander around the villages of Palestine saying, we want to meet with the apostolic fathers. Where are they? Can you show us where they meet? Nobody would be able to point you to them. Apostolic fathers are a, what we call a construct of later scholars. We have a collection of writings from the early church, which we group together for the sake of convenience because of their chronological placement under the name Apostolic Fathers, the, the fathers of the church just after the apostles. Many of them, we know hardly anything about them other than what we've got in the documents. Uh, and there's nothing that binds the documents together other than chronological placement. They all occur at this particular point in time. They are the earliest writers after the apostles. And therefore, they offer us interesting insights into the range of opinion and the kind of arguments that were being put forward by Christians, late first, beginning of the second century. And the first thing to notice about how the apostolic fathers operate is that uh, they assume that God's word has been written. They cite many of the books we now have in the New Testament canon. They cite them in their writings, and when they cite them, it's sort of game over that it's enough to cite these New Testament documents to prove your point, which indicates that these documents have a, a special authority. And when, when you're talking to your Christian friends, you might well cite a Bible verse, and you feel, well, that's the end of the argument. We cite the Bible verse there, bang, that's done. That's how the apostolic fathers are citing many of the New Testament books. And this has implications for our understanding of how the canon developed, the collection of books that we've decided belong to the New Testament, but it also has implications for what they understood those books to be. They understood them to be authoritative. You cite them, and it's not like citing just some, some, any old Joe out there. You cite these books, and it carries an intrinsic power and authority. And we even get them uh, writing. They, they will write little statements about what they think these books are or how God speaks. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, he's uh, a writer, somewhere, you know, he's born round about 150, died round about 215. So often with these guys, hey, we know very little about them other than what we have in uh, what they've written or much later books writing about them. Clement of Alexandria says this, the Lord is the source of our teaching. We have him by the gospel and the blessed apostles speaking in different ways and at many times. Uh, leading from the beginning of knowledge to the end. If anyone thinks that another origin was necessary, it would be impossible to find one. Whoever believes the scriptures and the voice of the Lord is being faithful. The Bible is the criterion of our knowledge. What's interesting, yeah, that's probably late second century, but already we have this man, Clement of Alexandria, who is talking about the scriptures and the voice of the Lord as essentially synonym indicating a very close identification between Scripture and what God says. Raises the question, of course, of, well, how did the, uh, the early church writers think that these books came about? What is it that makes First Peter a divinely inspired book? Was it just Peter was a great guy and anything he wrote was, you know, obviously worthy of including in the, in the canon? And Peter may well have written a shopping list at some point an inherent shopping list that indicates exactly what his wife should buy. But should that be included in the canon? No, because for a book to be included in the canon, the early church, the apostolic fathers, uh, talked about it being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, from our friend Clement, look carefully into the scriptures, he says, which are the true utterances of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks, utters Scripture elsewhere. He says, Beloved, you understand the Holy Scriptures very well. You have looked deeply into the prophecies of God. So the Scriptures are the prophecies, the utterances of God. Some early church writers, when they talk about this, imply that uh, the Bible was written almost by you know, God speaking into the ear of somebody and them writing it down. Uh, if you read that book, Jesus Calling, frightful book, wouldn't recommend it. But the lady at the start of that sort of implies that it's sort of, you know, Jesus whispered in her ear and she wrote these things down. It's how some of the early church fathers seem to have th thought that the Bible was written. Here's uh, a guy called Athanagoras, 
We have the prophets as witnesses of the things we understand and believe. Men like Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah and other prophets declared things about God and the things of God. It would be irrational of us to disbelieve God's spirit and accept mere human opinions instead. For God moved the mouths of the prophets as if they were musical instruments. It's an interesting statement. I actually disagree with the, uh, the view of inspiration, the method of inspiration that's being argued for there or being stated there. But what's very clear is that Athenagoras regards the words of the Bible as so close to the very words of God that it's as if the Lord is playing a flute. And, you know, the, the prophet is the flute, and it's the Lord blowing the air through the flute and creating the notes. We get the same thing in Gregory the Great in the 6th century. Gregory, for, if you're interested in sort of nerdy church history facts, Gregory the Great is probably the man most singularly responsible for, the, for, for consolidating the power of the Roman church in the early church. Great administrator. But he says this, It is pointless to ask who wrote the book of Job, since the Holy Spirit is rightly believed to have been its author. In other words, the one who wrote it is the one who dictated what is to be written. We have there, again, the idea, not a musical instrument now, but dictation. There is that idea that the prophet is there and the Lord is speaking to him and he's writing it down. And certainly there are some passages of Scripture that would indicate that that is on occasion what takes place. When Jeremiah is told to write down the words of this prophecy. But I would say, you know, if, I, if I were to sort of move into the realms of more systematic theology at this point, I would say Paul gives us no hint that that is how he wrote the book of Romans. Uh, for example. Luke goes out of his way to say, I've done a lot of historical research to put this thing together. Why would Luke have needed to do historical research uh, if God had simply dictated it to him? I could dictate a book uh, on a specialist theme to anybody who can write. They could write it down. It doesn't mean they know anything about it at all. Luke says he's done a lot of research. We have the same thing from a, a, a little document called the Muratorian Fragments, which also contains an early list of the canonical books. Although different things are taught in the different Gospels, there is no difference with respect to the faith of believers, because all of them were inspired by the same controlling spirit. So you get the idea then that they're beginning, they're not just thinking that Scripture is authoritative, but they have some sort of idea in their mind that this means there has to be some kind of dynamic connection between God and God's speech and what's actually been written down on the page. Imperfect, perhaps, or too generalized as the way they work it out might be, they clearly see there's got to be some kind of connection there. Connects also, we see this uh, uh, in the work of Theodoret of Sire, another uh, early church father. Some have said, he says, that not all the Psalms come from David, but the sum are the works of others. He more or shrugs his shoulders at this point. He says, I have no opinion either way. What difference does it make to me whether they are all David's or whether some of the compositions of others, when it is clear that they are all the fruits of the Holy Spirit's inspiration? What I would say about this, without drawing uh, any great dogmatic conclusion, I say what we're getting there in these early church fathers are certainly things that are consistent with what we see, say, in the 19th century in Princeton and their understanding of Scripture. There are great differences between the things that, say, a Warfield is reacting to and a Clement of Alexandria is writing about, but there are potent similarities such that I think we need to be very careful about saying, well, the 19th century Princeton guys invented all this stuff. Clearly, it has deep roots in uh, the early church. Can't leave the early church without talking about Augustine. Uh, if you've not read Augustine's Confessions, you barely have a credible profession of faith, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Augustine is the great bishop of, of Hippo in what is now North Africa, but in uh, ancient uh, days would simply be part of the Roman Empire. Augustine is sometimes referred to as an African theologian. He would not have had a clue what you were talking about if you'd said he was an African theologian. He would have said that he was a theologian of the Roman Empire. That's where he drew his identity. Augustine is uh, the single most influential theologian uh, in the West without anybody coming anywhere close. Uh, dominant force in Catholicism and in Protestantism. Could not have had the Reformation if he'd not first had Augustine. He is a 
monumental figure. So when Augustine writes on a topic, and he wrote an awful lot on an awful lot of topics, it's worth listening to. Augustine was friendly with a man called Jerome. Jerome is the man who translates the Bible into Latin, the so-called Vulgate, that was so important and influential in the Middle Ages. Uh, Jerome is a monk over in Palestine. And uh, in the days before Facebook and Twitter, etc., etc., uh, people had to actually write letters to each other and compose whole sentences and things like that. Uh, Jerome and Augustine carried on a correspondence. And uh, in a couple of the letters to Jerome, Augustine makes very interesting statements about Scripture. Letter 28 to Jerome, he says this, once you admit that a false statement has been made out of a sense of duty, context is he's speaking about a good person who feels it necessary to tell a lie to achieve a greater good, there will be not a single sentence in the entire Bible that will be free of such suspicion if it seems difficult in practice or hard to believe. In such circumstances, it would be all too easy to explain the passage away by saying that the writer deceived his readers out of a sense of duty. So Augustine there is very concerned about the idea, well, maybe the Bible sort of accommodates some of what it says uh, to achieve a higher good among people reading it when it's not actually true or correct. It's an interesting sort of thought. He goes on in letter 82 to make an even more pertinent statement. Of all the books of the world, I believe that only the authors of Holy Scripture were totally free from error. And if I am puzzled by anything in them that seems to go against the truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty or well, the translator has not caught the sense of what was said. Augustine was really much more comfortable in Latin than any other language. Or I have failed to understand it for myself. It's interesting, Augustine says, when I'm reading the Bible and I come across something that seems to be a mistake or a contradiction, I assume one of the three things. I, scream, I assume it's a copyist's error in the manuscripts. I assume it's a mistranslation. Or I assume that I'm just not clever enough to grasp what's going on. So it's an interesting sort of take uh, on, on things. A couple of years ago, when uh, inerrancy was, was uh, causing something of a stir at Westminster, I had a friend who was doing a PhD at the University of Cambridge on Augustine, and we were uh, emailing, and he said, coming from Britain, the term is not, inerrancy is not in such common currency. And he said, what does inerrancy mean? So I, uh, I think I sent him the Chicago statement on inerrancy. I said, well, this, you know, it's, there are debates about exactly what it means, but this is a sort of standard statement. And he read it and emailed me back, and he said, well, that's, exa- that's just what Augustine believed. I thought it was an interesting comment coming from somebody who had no particular axe to grind on the issue, but was a, uh, an expert on St. Augustine. So in the early church, then, we can see authoritative scripture. We can see uh, some sort of attempt to explain uh, how scripture gets written down and is the word of God. And we also, in Augustine, we, we reach the point where we can say, well, you know, these people are not idiots. They are capable of reading the Bible and seeing that there are problems there. Uh, and they feel the need, therefore, to address these problems given the other things that they are arguing about. Coming out to the Middle Ages. Middle Ages is the big hole in a lot of Protestant thinking. Uh, If I had my time again, I wouldn't do a Reformation PhD. I'd probably do a PhD on the Middle Ages because it's been much neglected by Protestants, and yet so much of Protestant theology is really forged in the later Middle Ages. Uh, Can't discuss every medieval theologian. Just make a a couple of comments in general on their approach to Scripture. Uh, The first one is that in the West, they weren't dealing with the original Greek and Hebrew. Uh, Those languages had really fallen into disuse in the West. So the great theologians of the West, such as Thomas Aquinas, Albert uh, Albert the Great, uh, Bonaventure, people like this, they were dealing with Scripture in Latin translation, which actually makes it quite, you know, the the amount of uh, of brilliant commentary that exists from the Middle Ages, given the fact that they were working with translations, is very, very impressive. Uh, What the Middle Ages did, if it didn't develop uh, a great linguistic tradition, that will come with Protestantism, 
What the Middle Ages did was it, it, it reflected, the middle, medieval theologians reflected on the concepts underlying theology. Now, take a man like Thomas Aquinas. I think it's worth stressing that you know, many people, if they know Thomas at all, they know him as the author of the Summa Theologiae, uh, which was actually, he, was, he wrote that, uh, he died while, still, uh, while it was still, in, uh, still unfinished. The Summa Theologiae was actually intended as a, a kind of beginner's classroom handbook of theology. In no way was it meant to, to be the definitive statement of theology by Aquinas. If you want to look at Aquinas' theology as most brilliant, you've got to look at these things called disputed questions, the debates that he would have in class. Aquinas, like every other medieval theologian, was also required to exegete his way through more scripture before he became remotely considered qualified to teach uh, theology than anybody at any Protestant seminary in the United States today. So we can be very hard as Protestants on the Middle, Middle Ages and say they really weren't interested in Scripture. That's simply not true. They didn't have access to the Greek and Hebrew in the way we did. But exposition of Scripture was central and basic to all that went on in the medieval theological curriculum. Of all of the medieval theologians, Thomas Aquinas is without doubt, I think, the greatest, great 13th century theologian, student of Albert the Great. Albert the Great had that great uh, delight, I think, as a teacher of training a man that he must have known relatively early on was going to be far more brilliant than him. And as all quality teachers do, he helped Aquinas in his career rather than trying to destroy his career so that he remained top dog. You've got to like Albert for that. What Thomas did, Thomas made a very helpful and important distinction that comes down into Protestantism and I think uh, helps us to uh, nuance our understanding of Scripture in a way that was really unavailable in the, in the early church. Thomas makes a distinction between inspiration and revelation. And I think one of the problems with uh, those guys in the early church, particularly the, you know, God plays you like a flute or God dictates it to you and you write it all down, is that they didn't have that distinction. That what was revealed and the way it was revealed were one and the same thing for them. Aquinas makes a distinction. Revelation is that which is specially presented to somebody that they couldn't possibly naturally know. So revelation applies particularly to prophecy, for example. But the other side of it is Aquinas talks about inspiration. And inspiration is the Holy Spirit exalting somebody's natural faculties in a way that allows them to write down things that are inspired and true. And that, I think, is a critical distinction. It's made in the, uh, in the 13th century, and that is helpful because really that allows us to get out from under the idea that every bit of scripture has to be dictated, which immediately runs into all kinds of problems if you think about it. So why does Peter write like Peter and Paul write like Paul? Why do we know that they, you know, they're two different people? Even if we weren't told their names, you'd read them and you'd think, well, this guy doesn't write. It, it looks like two different people writing. You know, you know when you read James Joyce or you read Charles Dickens, it's pretty easy to tell the difference. Joyce has sentences that go on for 150 pages or something. Dickens' sentences are long, but they don't go on that long. You know there's a difference. And what was done in the 13th century by making this distinction, I think it actually ultimately opens the way for us to start thinking about the human distinctiveness of the different Christian authors. Not that there aren't passages in Scripture that appear to be dictated. Write down the words of this prophecy that I shall give you. That's not the letter Romans. That's not Luke writing his gospel. There, Aquinas would say, those are great examples of inspiration. Luke has all of this historical material before him, and the Holy Spirit inspires his mind to use his God-given historian talents to put all this stuff together. So it's distinctively Luke, but it's actually talking authoritatively about the Lord Jesus Christ as well. So, Thomas, very important for developing this distinction. 
the same time, we also have, uh, just shortly after Thomas, a man called Duns Scotus on the scene. Um, Scotus, Duns Scotus, from where we get the English word dunce. Don't know if it was ever done in America, but certainly when my granddad was at school, uh, if you were naughty or you failed the test, you had to sit in a corner with a paper hat on with a D on the front, standing for dunce, meaning you're an idiot. These days, of course, you'd sue for three million for the emotional trauma and damage and the way it had ruined the entire rest of your life. In those days, you just had to get on with it and go out and get a job afterwards. Poor old dunce, he's brilliant, but nobody, he's, so, he's so subtle a thinker. He's one of those guys, you read him and you think he's either a genius or he's an idiot. And, you know, if you don't understand somebody, it's always more comforting to assume they're an idiot rather than a genius. So poor old Duns gets uh, labeled as a, uh, his, his name comes down to mean idiot. One other sort of gruesome fact about him, uh, he's buried in the crypt of Cologne Cathedral. If you're ever passing through Cologne in Germany and you've got half an hour to spare, it's just opposite the railway. So you run out of the railway station, you can look at one of the classic medieval cathedrals in Europe. He was buried in the crypt there, and when they opened the crypt to bury the next uh, guy, they found Duns's body out of the coffin. They'd obviously buried him alive, and the coolness of the grave had revived him, and then he died this terrifying and lonely death, trapped in the crypt. Um, becomes a bit of an obsession. If you know anything about German, uh, you probably don't know anything about German cemeteries and their history. It's a slightly obscure subject, but Germans developed all kinds of ways so that when you were buried, you could still signal to people if you were alive. So they'd have elaborate bell systems. So if you're in your coffin and you woke up, you could pull a string and it'd ring a bell and they'd dig you up and, and save you. Dunn sort of fits into that whole tradition, which has nothing to do with the authority of scripture, but I love telling that story. Dunn Scotus is important because he is the man who accents the sufficiency of scripture. Often we don't think of that as a Catholic doctrine, do we? Uh, but Duns wanted to emphasize that all that was necessary for salvation was contained in Scripture. Now that can connect to a Catholic view, of course, because the sufficiency of Scripture and the interpretation of Scripture are two slightly different things. But Duns was the man who really focused on Scripture canon as being sufficient because it was exactly what God wanted. Coming out of the Reformation, how does the doctrine of Scripture... Well, one thing to say about the Middle Ages is that prior to the Reformation, in fact, really prior to the late 16th century, nobody ever elaborated a doctrine of Scripture. The doctrine of Scripture as a separate place in the theological curriculum, that's definitely a Protestant innovation because it becomes very important in Protestantism. In many ways, what I've been trying to lay out thus far in this lecture, the, the authority of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, that was basically assumed. So nobody ever felt the need to, to sort of develop it in any elaborate way and reflect upon it. That all changes at the Reformation. Why does Scripture become a, a big issue at the Reformation? Well, I think it, 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 there are two figures, I think, that are particularly important for understanding Scripture at the Reformation. They are two men who will go on to become deadly enemies, Martin Luther and Huldrych Zwingli. Luther will be the great reformer of Electoral Saxony in the Holy Roman Empire, and Zwingli will be the great reformer of Zurich, the uh, independent city, a city independent from the Holy Roman Empire in Switzerland. The two men will fall out badly over the Lord's Supper. Luther dis will despise Zwingli till his dying day when Zwingli is killed on the battlefield in 1531, and the news arrives in Wittenberg that his old rival is dead, Luther says, well, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And he carries on with his beer and his, his dinner. There's no time for him at all. These two men, though, serve to push Scripture into the limelight in the Reformation. For Luther, it happens almost by accident, I think. Luther starts his Reformation protest in 1517, objecting to the sale of indulgences in Ducal Saxony, uh, just over the river from, from Electoral Saxony, where Luther is based. Luther is not sure. These are, in, indulgences are pieces of paper, and you pay money, and they give you a bit of time off purgatory, or they give you a granny time off purgatory. You can buy them for somebody else if you wish. And Luther just doesn't really know what the church is teaching on this is, but he's pretty sure that the man selling them over the river is giving the wrong sales pitches. You know, the man saying, every time a coin in the copper rings, soul from purgatory springs. If you've raped the Virgin Mary, 
One of my indulgences would be sufficient to square it away. Those are the sort of pitches that uh, this man called Tetzel is laying out. And Luther is concerned that you can't just buy the grace of God with a mere cash transaction. There has to be repentance. He's not yet fully Protestant, but he knows there has to be some kind of change of heart connected to grace. So Luther launches his protest in 1517 uh, uh, and uh, really raises the question of, well, well, this man's selling indulgence is wrong. In fact, of course, the Pope doesn't know what indulgences are really at this point. The Pope has to commission a special committee to draw up a report on what indulgences are. Uh, and it emerges fairly quickly that Luther is challenging the Pope's authority. I don't think Luther intended to do that. I think Luther felt that if the Pope knew what was going on, he'd close Tetzel down. But actually, the Pope's got too much money invested in this. The, uh, the Vatican is under severe financial pressure at this point. Pope has too much money invested in it. And so uh, he doesn't close the indulgence down. He tries to close Luther down. And so Luther is pushed to reflect more and more on his position. And in 1519, he travels to the university city of Leipzig to debate a former friend, now a deadly enemy. There's kind of a pattern emerges in Luther's life on, the, on that front, a man called John Eck, on the kind of theology that's being developed in Wittenberg. And it's really at Leipzig, I think, that Luther begins to realize that the scripture principle and the doctrine of scripture is going to be important because Eck is a brilliant debater far better debater than Luther, I think. And Eck essentially traps Luther at Leipzig. Uh, Luther is, by that point, it's very clear that he doesn't have a lot of confidence in the Pope. So Eck starts to push Luther on councils. If you think about the medieval church, you've got the Pope at the top, but then every now and then the papacy hits cry. You've got more than one Pope. Who do you look to? Well, beginning of the 15th century, they had a great council at Constance, and the council resolved the problem. So you have these sort of two ways of resolving problems. You've got the papacy. If the papacy doesn't work, you have a council. And Eck points Luther. Luther says something that seems to tie him in with a man called John Huss, who was condemned at the Council of Constance. And Eck's onto this straight away. He says, ah, well, if you're backing Huss, Huss is a condemned heretic, condemned by the Council of Constance. And Luther's response, foolish response in the context of a debate is this. Well, many of the things condemned by the Council of Constance are actually good and true doctrine. Luther's correct, but X straight onto that. Okay, Luther, so the Pope can err. We can't trust the Pope. Now you're telling us the councils err. We can't trust the councils. Where do we go from here? And in the context of the late Middle Ages, that's a powerful argument. And it really, over the, the next few years, drives Luther back to an increasing emphasis upon Scripture as authoritative. Now, famously, of course, Luther rejects the book of James. He doesn't actually reject the book of James. He sort of puts it in an appendix to the New Testament because he thinks it teaches the law of God wonderfully. It just doesn't contain any gospel. It doesn't mention Jesus. But bear in mind that views of individual books like that and not necessarily indicative of one's understanding of inspiration, so much as they are as indicative of one's understanding of the extent of the canon. And those are two slightly different issues. Uh, Luther has some wonderful things to say about James. Uh, one of his statements is he said, if I could rip little Jimmy from the Bible and throw him on the fire, I would. And uh, James 3.1, not many should aspire to be teachers. Luther glossed that in his Bible with the statement, oh James, if only you had taken your own advice. Uh, so he was, pretty, he was pretty blunt about the, the lack of gospel in the book of James. But it's that. It's that need for authority that drives Luther to think about the Scripture principle. And it really comes to its full fruition with Luther in 1525, when Erasmus clashes with him. Erasmus, the great Dutch humanist, writes this work on the freedom of the will, 1524. And Luther responds in 1525 with, on the bondage of the will actually more literally on the bondage of judgment. The, the Latin word is not quite the same as, as will. And in that book, not only does he argue for the bondage of the human will to sin, he also argues that Scripture is essentially clear in the basics it teaches. Not that if I hand you a Greek or a Hebrew testament and you don't have Greek or Hebrew, you can just look at the pretty pictures on the page and, and understand what it's saying, but anybody who's access to a decent translation 
or anyone who hears somebody reading the Bible in their own language, explaining the Bible in their own language to them, should be able to grasp clearly the message. You don't need a degree. So Luther really pushes. His interest in the doctrine of Scripture is really on canon and on perspicuity. The Bible is clear. Zwingli, uh, more briefly, uh, Zwingli's uh, move to uh, uh, emphasizing Scripture was, how do I reform my city? Get rid of the papacy, what do we do? Well, Zwingli wanted his city reformed in accordance with Scripture. Scripture becomes a kind of blueprint for his social reform. Most ob has its most obvious impact in his understanding of worship. Uh, Zwingli didn't even have music in worship. Didn't have singing, I should say. You know, the lack of musical instruments is pretty, pretty standard in reformed churches up until the 19th century. Zwingli didn't even have singing in his worship because he just didn't see it in the New Testament. So Zwingli, too, uh, has a, a central view for Scripture. What is interesting in the 16th and 17th century, of course, is that we, we see a growth in sophistication in the approach to Scripture uh, among Protestants. And the basic reason for this, of course, is humanism. 15th, 16th century, the Renaissance. Uh, when I say humanism, don't think Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, they're humanists, but they're not what I'm thinking of. Humanism in the 16th, 17th, 15th, 16th century would say, referring to men of letters, literary figures. The 15th, 16th century sees a growth in interest in the original languages, Greek and Hebrew. And for the first time, for a thousand years, really, those being trained for the ministry, those studying Scripture, have access to Scripture in the original languages. And this, I think, has a, has a, a twofold effect. Uh, on the one hand, it makes exegesis much more sophisticated. Uh, why, we could ask ourselves, why was there so much interest in Greek and Hebrew among Protestants? in the 16th and 17th centuries. It's because of their high view of inspiration. Because they were convinced that Scripture was inspired in the form in which God had originally given it. The Vulgate was not inspired. The Vulgate was a Latin translation. Your ESVs, your NIVs, your King James versions, they're not inspired, they're translations. 16th, 17th century Protestantism became convinced that the Bible was inspired in the original languages. And that, therefore, made the original languages of vital importance. If you're training people for the ministry, you need to train them in the original languages because only then are they grappling with God's Word as God's Word and not something one step removed from it. But the second effect of that, of course, was it put huge pressure on Protestantism because things start to become an issue which were never an issue before. Uh, perhaps most dramatically, I think, this is really something that we, we find in, in, the, in the 1640s, 1650s, and 1660s, where Protestants, because they took the original languages so seriously, started to produce these great polyglot Bibles. Most famous is Brian Walton's polyglot Bible. Uh, from England in the 17th century. Polyglot Bibles essentially gathered together original manuscripts and translations of the Bible and had them arranged so you could compare them. And of course, when you start to get down into the nitty-gritty of the text, because you want to get down into the nitty-gritty of what God originally said, you start having to address textual problems. And those things that uh, Augustine remember Augustine alluded to, uh, these become much more powerfully important in the 16th and 17th century because now you're addressing them in the original languages. But it's not quite the same problem as we might have today. It's, uh, maybe it's a sort of version perhaps of that problem, but I can imagine somebody saying, to you, well, you know, we've got these three manuscripts here and this verse isn't in two of the three. Is it inspired or not? And therefore, does that cast doubt, you know, if you want to extrapolate from that, does that cast doubt on the whole thing? How do we know that any of these things were copied down correctly? That's probably how it would play out today. 
In the 16th, 17th century, it plays out in the context of Protestant Catholic polemic. Uh, the big issue for Catholics, the way the Catholics could nail the Protestants was to demonstrate that Scripture was not sufficient. And so if you can demonstrate there are a lot of variant readings in Scripture, it pushes you to, well, how do you decide which readings are the real ones and which ones have just crept in because some idiot wasn't paying attention when he was copying the original codices. And that, of course, pushes you back to the Pope, the Church. You need the Church to establish the text for you. So in the 16th, 17th century, high view of scripture generates, fuels, powers this great interest in the original languages, which is a very, very positive thing. But the interest in the original languages itself generates certain problems. And um, this is one of the, you know, sometimes uh, you'll, you'll hear the historiography of text criticism, something like this. Well, you know, the 17th century, you had all these guys, and they were just interested in proof texting. They didn't do exegesis. They were very wooden in their approach to Scripture. And suddenly they were swept away by all the text critic guys. Doesn't make sense, does it? Because you've got to ask, where do the text critic guys come from? Actually, the story is this. Because these guys had a high view of Scripture, they ended up studying manuscripts and raising questions that actually fueled text criticism. So there was a sense in which what Protestantism did was it created a world on that level which generated its own problems and its own instabilities. And it led to significant discussions among the Protestant Orthodox on the history of the text. It actually led to, to changing opinions on some things. If you've got a Hebrew Bible, you'll know that there are vowel points in, in the Hebrew. And you'll know that they were added at a later date. Early in the Reformation, nobody cared about the dating of the vowel points. By the time you get to the latter part of the 17th century, the conservative guys are demanding an early date. Because if you have a late date, it means somebody added them to Scripture, which means you're starting to stick tradition in on top of Scripture, which means you're conceding stuff to the Catholics. I think probably the truth lies somewhere between the two. I mean, ultimately, every language needs vowels, whether they're written down or not. But you can see how Protestantism created its own issues and problems. And to add to that, there was also the issue of interpretation. Protestantism was, uh, it started off in, in very vibrantly in the early 16th century. Uh, Luther, after Leipzig, develops his understanding of the, uh, the sufficiency, the clarity and perspicuity of Scripture. The problem, of course, throughout the 16th century is that more and more Protestant groups start to arise with differing interpretations of Scripture based on fundamentally the same Scripture principle, which raises the question of how do you differentiate between them. And the sort of the final stage in this process took place in the late 16th century when you had a group called the Sassinians. The way that Calvin proceeds with Scripture or Luther is, I think we might say, it's a, a hermeneutic of trust with the tradition. They look back to the early church. They look back to people like Aquinas, and they assume that Scripture is basically clear, so these guys basically got it right. The Sassinians said, no, we want to draw a line under everything that's come after the apostles. They're the kind of no creed but the Bible guys. Let's go back and reinvent it all from the beginning. And a basic scriptural literalism arose that took a high view of Scripture and by doing so abolished the notion of God's sovereignty, notions of the Trinity, and thus pulled the foundations away from a high view of Scripture. You need to have a notion of God as sovereign. You need to have a notion of God as Trinity, I think, in order to have a high view of Scripture. So Protestantism descends into something of a mess towards the end of the 17th century. In response, I mean, the reform fought back and fought back hard. What we find uh, in, the, in the 17th century is very good arguments in a writer like Turretin on text-critical matters, that even if one concedes that there are differences among the manuscripts, Turretin makes the point none of these differences actually reflect any substantial difference in theology. 
Uh, Turretin was one of those who has the idea that there are original autographs, inerrant manuscripts. Maybe they don't exist anymore, but at some point there was a definitive scripture which has become corrupted through copyist errors. What is interesting with Turretin, though, is that he has no desire to try to reconstruct those at all. He's very confident that through providence, the texts we have are quite sufficient to do the task that the Lord has designed them to do. John Owen spends much time reflecting upon the role of the Holy Spirit in inspiration, how it pervades the writer of Scripture, exalts his power so that the writer of Scripture writes in a manner which reflects his own character. So, to summarize then, we look at the 19th century understanding of inerrancy, high view of Scripture, high view of, iner uh, 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 high view of inerrancy, high view of Scripture's truth. That depends upon various things. It depends upon an understanding of God as a speaking God. It depends upon an understanding of uh, words as adequate to communicate divine truth. It depends upon a close connection between God's speech and what is actually written down. All of those things have precedent uh, within the Christian tradition. It is not that we could go back to the 16th, 17th century or the early church and find exactly what Hodge and Moorfield wrote in the 19th century there. Their issues were different. But I think what we can find there are positions that are fundamentally consistent with that which is developed later. I've got a few minutes left. I'll take any questions that you might have. Again, apologies, covering a sort of huge area in just 45 minutes. I take seven credit hours to do that at Westminster, which is 140 hours of class time. Yeah. It? Well, we appreciate you at least giving it a solid try. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we're going to take some time for some questions. So feel free, if you'd like to, raise your hand. I'll come around, and uh, you can ask your question. Um, the, uh, what was the, the early church father's view on um, Genesis? Six days, literal, mm. allegorical. Um, some people say that uh, Augustine, uh, you know, um, didn't have a six-day literal view. Yeah. And I was just curious what your, you know. Yeah, it's a good question. I think there are, um, first of all, as a sort of caveat to my answer is, when you ask, you know, what's the early church father's view? Of course, we only have a, a, small, a relatively small selection, really, of early church writers anyway. So it's very difficult to, to extrapolate from what we've got to what would have been a universal received view. Um, Augustine is, is certainly more allegorical than literal, my reading of him, which seems to imply that, that literal six days was not absolutely normative. Um, so beyond that, I'm not sure I can, I can go further than that. As I say, we have very limited access to, to ancient church commentary on that. So, uh, and they would not have been faced with the same issues that we were, we were faced by today. And Augustine's view is connected to his own, you know, his platonic view of time. There are all kinds of complexities to Augustine that would not apply to us today. They would certainly not have doubted that Adam was a historical figure. And that, I think, uh, the, the unity of the human race in Adam was a given. You made a comment about uh, the fathers knowing some of the difficulties in harmonizing problem texts, and that that would shed light also on what they thought of the, the scripture that they were trying to harmonize. Could you elaborate on that or give well, an example? I think that was in the context of Augustine, the, the saying of Augustine, that they're, very, they're clearly uh, aware that there are uh, problems. Well, no, problems is putting it too strong, but they're clearly aware that they have problems in reconciling certain passages uh, of Scripture. And I think that the, the standard... Well, I think, the, again, uh, without wanting to generalize too much, I think... One finds two approaches in the ancient church and the medieval church, two broad approaches. One is trying to harmonize in a traditional way. Well, how do we connect these chronologies in a way that they all match up? The other one, I, I think, which is connected to it is the development of allegorical exegesis. 
that some of the issues in Scripture can be dissolved by saying, well, they're not meant to be literal. They, they, their real true meaning is, is an allegorical one. And that becomes very strong in certain strands of medieval theology. So awareness of the awareness of difficulties of reconciliation in Scripture, yes, and a variety of approaches in solving them. I think it would break down basically into those two, the we might say the historical and the, the allegorical. The Catholics have uh, the Apocrypha. What time period did that occur, and is it considered canonical or not? Uh, well, it's not con considered canonical by Protestants, though Protestants have varied in their positivity towards it. I mean, the, the Anglican Church, for example, is more positive about the Apocrypha in the 39 Articles than the Westminster Confession would be. The issue of canon is... Uh, one, it's a highly technical area that I'm not qualified to comment on in terms of the, the sort of the, the New Testament stuff. But it's also the biblical canon is remarkably fluid up until the Reformation. Uh, not so much in terms of the core material, which I think is settled on pretty early. I think you make a good case for a functional canon in the Apostolic Fathers. But if you look at the history of Bible production in the Middle Ages, you get some weird stuff bound into Bibles in the Middle Ages. And when you get to a man like Augustine, uh, not Augustine, you get to a man like Luther, Luther is happy to quote Ecclesiasticus, and yet he's also happy to re reject James. So I think the, the real, it's not really until the Protestant Reformation that we get a real sharpening of the boundaries of the New, uh, of the New and Old Testament canons. Uh, as I say, I'm basing that in part on medieval book production of, you know, what is bound in the Bible. Maybe in 2,000 years' time, people might find the Schofield Bible a little weird from that perspective, or even the ESV Study Bible. Who knows? Uh, but I'm thinking about really odd, you know, histories being stuck in there that really have nothing to do with the Bible. And there does seem to be quite a lot of flexibility, perhaps not so much on the core that's included as extra stuff that's sometimes bolted in. But the Apocrypha is rejected at the Reformation. It's not there in the Hebrew. It's not part of the Hebrew Bible. And the, the, most, the most typical Protestants would regard it as being full of interesting but irrelevant tales, by and large. Dr. Truman, one question I think uh, may be on some people's minds is, can you tell us how and at what time and why did the term inerrancy enter into the theological terminology yeah. of the church? Well, it becomes commonplace really towards the end of the 19th century. The earliest, I think the earliest that I've ever come across it uh, was a top lady, 18th century Anglican. He uses the term, or a very close equivalent, unerring or something like that uh, in, in some of his writings. So you could certainly trace the term or an immediate cognate back to the 18th century. But, you know, words and concepts, I, I'm never over concerned about. You know, a word only emerges typically once the concept has been around for a while. Uh, in my own field of 17th century studies, for example, covenant of redemption which is a term used to apply, imply that the Father and the Son are in covenant together. Covenant of redemption suddenly emerges in 1645. I think it's used once in 1638 and once in 1520. And then suddenly everybody's using it in 1645. It becomes commonplace. But you can trace the concept back before. And I would say that you know, what I quoted from Augustine there is that second letter, is it letter 82? is pretty much consistent with inerrancy and not with any other position, I think. So the term 18th century onwards, certainly not invented by the old Princetonians, you can trace it back before that. The concept, I think, is, is certainly held by some in the church at a much, much earlier date. I might also just add that, uh, you know, inerrancy to me, I, I don't like it as a term. But I think it fulfills a very useful function. Uh, so what would that I, function be? I would regard be? myself as an inerrantist, but I would regard myself in many ways, I regard it as in many ways an inadequate term to express what I really believe about the Bible. 
Can you tell us what you think the function of it is? Why that's? I think the function of it is to, to emphasize that the words in Scripture are exactly what God wants them to be. And that God speaks truth and does not deceive. I think those two things, it, it's trying to protect them. My one concern about it is that sometimes you, you, need to, you, need to, you need to be more than an inerrantist. Jehovah's Witnesses are inerrantist. You need to be more than an inerrantist to have a proper biblical view of Scripture and Revelation. Um, a lot of times people do selective reading of the Bible, um, especially in modern times trying to, you know, oh, I don't like that verse about homosexuality, so I'll ignore that. Is there a history throughout the early church of people kind of doing selective readings, or is that not indicated? Good question. Um, well, first of all, I would say we all do selective readings of the Bible at some level. That's why you have to go to church so that the guy up front can point out to you where you've been selective. And you can point out to him where he's been selective too. Uh, next time you're at Cornerstone. Um, there is a strong history of this. And uh, a lot of it connects to, in the early church, to canon issues. I mean, the, the canon, one of the big impulses towards reflecting on the canon is the second century theologian Marcia, who just wants to get rid of the Old Testament and most of the New Testament because he feels that it, well, it, it does it advocates repulsive practices like sexual intercourse. Oh, you know, Marcion was the lucky recipient of that. The very fact that he exists would indicate that it can't be that repulsive, you'd have thought. Uh, but also that God is just a, the, the God of the Old Testament is just a God of, of, of wrath, that he takes delight in genocides. So it can't be scriptural. So we could say that the debates about canon are debates about selectivity at that level. Then, of course, you know, we could, we could zip forward to the 18th century and good old Thomas Jefferson, um, wonderful writer of uh, a petition, the, the Declaration of Independence, terrible uh, 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 person when handling the Bible, just, you know, if he didn't quite fit with his you know, 18th century uh, sensibilities, it couldn't possibly have been divinely inspired and therefore we need to get rid of it. So, I would say selective reading of Scripture both informally, as we all do it, and formally, as people like Marcion and Jefferson did it, has been a, a perennial. And in some ways we have that a little bit now with you know, Bart Ehrman, Elaine Pagels, and the other Gospels that they say were excluded and why aren't they included. Uh, they too are reading Scripture selectively in, in a strange sort of inverse way. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just speak to the importance of the word being written down. You said that they're written the way that God wanted it to be. And I know that there are people that think about the spoken word being yep. the important thing. And there are a lot of oral traditions for a very yep. long time. So talking about translations and just the difference. Yeah. And, the, you know, one of the things I, I didn't mention about Protestantism, of course, is that Protestantism is primarily a movement of the spoken word because the 16th century, just materially, most people were illiterate, so if you want to learn the Bible, you've got to go and hear somebody read it or preach it to you. And secondly, Protestantism had a rich theology of the preached word. How were people transformed? By hearing the word, the word from outside, as Luther said, declared to them. So I'm going to say to students at Westminster, if you think, if you think of your life in terms of the quiet time, you need to realize that most Christians would not have had quiet times for most of church history because most Christians, A, couldn't read and B, couldn't afford a Bible. But they were still Christians, so where were they getting it from? The word preached, the word, the word spoken. Uh, I think that I would argue on the basis of Scripture itself that the writing down of the word is important. Paul talks about a form of sound words. He talks about Scripture being inspired and useful for teaching. Um, he... You know, the very reason why Moses writes, writes uh, down the regulations of the Passover is so that the, the spoken word, when your children, Exodus 12, when your children ask you what is the meaning of these things, you tell them what happened. Well, how do you know what happened? It's been written down for you. So I would certainly want to say, to affirm the spoken word very powerfully, but say that, that the Lord seems to have ascribed to Scripture a norming capacity for the spoken word. So... Again, with Protestants, I would want to, you know, maybe this would be another, not criticism I would have of the term inerrancy, but when we talk about inerrancy, let's not forget that it's actually the word proclaimed that is powerful. That inerrancy refers to Scripture and its normative capacity, but it's the proclamation and the application of that word 
that is the way the Spirit works today. Um, and again, one of the criticisms of Protestantism, it's very wordy in an image ba- How do you communicate Protestantism in an image-based world? Do we do it by images? Well, no, because then it wouldn't be Protestantism. But I do think that that is a, a criticism which should lead us to reflect once again on the richness and power of the spoken word. Uh, and is it the spoken word that comes from somebody standing in front of you rather than mediated through a screen, because I think bodies are also important to the power of the word. Thank you for coming. And this, as I said at the beginning, this wraps up the inaugural lecture series for the Boys Center. And uh, Lord willing, in, in coming weeks and months, we'll be able to uh, hopefully present uh, another series of opportunities, whether it be uh, a conference of some kind or a series of lectures. Is, that's all in the works. So um, I just wanted you to know that ahead of time. But thank you for coming, Dr. Truman. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And, uh, Hope you all have a good weekend.